Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas for VMware Explore 2024. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with my co-host Dave Vellante. Our 15th year covering this event, seeing the transformation of VMware, the technology and ultimately the customers. We've got two great guests here to break it down. Chris Prasad, Senior Vice President, General Manager of the VMware Cloud Foundation Division, also known as VCF at Broadcom. And Manavir Vass, Das, VP of Enterprise Compute at NVIDIA. Manavir, good to see you again. Welcome back to theCUBE, both Thank CUBE you. alumni. Thank you, guys. Thank you, great yes. to be back. <laughs> Enterprise Compute at NVIDIA. Okay, you're the man of the hour. Everyone wants to, NVIDIA. Can we get some GPUs for theCUBE? <laughs> <laughs> They're right down here. <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding, I'm sure you get that question all the time. Yeah. Um, obviously, the success and congratulations on all the, all the great stuff. Love GTC this year. Continue the thundering away on the momentum. The customer base, the market is evolving. Products and transitions as well. All the platforms are there. You guys were on stage, Jets was on stage last year with the partnership with Broadcom, now VMware bought Broadcom. Give us an update, how's that going? Because that's been a key partnership, and with VCF kind of hitting its stride, yeah. Chris. Yep. So last year, uh, Raghu and Jensen were on the stage together, and uh, we announced the new solution for Gen AI, which is a, a, a well-integrated stack, uh, which has NVIDIA software in it, the virtualization of the GPU, all put together, and at that time it was a conceptual announcement, hey, we are working on it together, and uh, now, you know, what, a year, year later we have already released it, it is out in the market, customers are using it, and it's one of the hottest areas that we have in our portfolio. Man, what are some of the key milestones that you can share with the past year, what are some of the accomplishments this past year? Yeah, you know, I think, if I may put it this way, right, the world has changed in the last year. Uh, for enterprise companies, which is the common focus for us, right? Because a year ago, these models that are the basis of AI were just not good enough for enterprises to actually adopt and use cases. You know, open, open AI had gone a long way, but the ecosystem of models from Meta and Mistral, et cetera, were just not there. And that's what's fundamentally changed in the last year. These models have become really, really good. Like if you look at Llama 3.1, and so, the milestone you're, you're talking about, what we realized was the point of inflection is arriving where enterprise companies can deploy Gen AI for themselves, okay? And so now the challenge is, how are they going to do that? What are they going to put in their building to make that happen, right? And so, uh, we've come to the point where enterprise IT needs to deploy a new platform. They deployed database, they deployed virtualization, they made the move to the cloud, and now the next platform is, how do I get my own Gen AI infrastructure for my company so that all the people building use cases across my company, building chatbots across my company, have this one platform that they can depend on. And that was actually why we did the work together, because we said that platform is, you pick your OEM infrastructure with GPUs in it, and then you use VCF as the operating system sort of that's on top of that infrastructure, and between us, we've given you all the pieces that you can just, as a developer, write your app. And everything else is provided for you. Over the past, you do that on top yeah, of? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, the interesting thing is, we started this partnership around five years ago. And, and at that time, Gen AI was not in the picture. Yeah. Yeah. But we, we were saying, hey, we want to bring AI to the enterprise. <laughs> okay, and that was the vision. And, yeah. and both of us got our engineering teams together and they have been working very hard to really virtualize the GPU, the software stack that NVIDIA produced, you know, and we integrated all of that, and that was the announcement we made last if year. If you look at the success of CUDA and what's happening with, with the hardware, I mean, price, the price performance of the models, like yeah. Lamy mentioned, tokens yeah. or prices are dropping, throughput's going through the roof, more horsepower, democratized supercomputing yeah. for the yeah. masses. Yeah. You guys were years ahead. What's that mean for the customers? What is that, how did that translate? into the partnership specifically. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say, you know, uh, so um, they now have choice, right? Because uh, when Gen AI began really, uh, the only way to really experience it was somebody has got a canned service in the cloud and I'm going to use that. I mean, OpenAI started this whole trend and they've been brilliant in what they've done and they still are brilliant and they're expanding their capabilities all the time. But I think customers want choice, right? For some people it's okay to use somebody else's service. Uh, for other customers, I need to have my own sort of 
private way of doing my AI. Whether I'm on-prem or on the cloud, it doesn't matter, right? And so, the solution we built allows a customer to say, I'll choose my environment. Maybe I'm an AWS shop, maybe I'm an Azure shop, maybe I'm an HPE on-prem shop, I'm a Dell on-prem shop. It doesn't matter who, what choice you make, we give you a way to build your Gen AI. So what does that adoption look like, Chris? I mean, because many, most companies just haven't been able to get their hands on these GPUs, so they had to, they've had to go to the cloud, or these specialty clouds. It's, uh, it's starting to free up. I mean, yeah. we hear the earnings calls, and yeah. you know, the timelines, we'll hear more to, uh, tonight, actually. But um, what's it like on-prem? Customers, clearly the ones we talk to, want to do yes. AI on-prem. Yes. What's that adoption look like? Yeah, I mean, so the private in private AI really is about not on-prem. It's really about keeping the data private and bringing the AI processing to the data. Okay, and so VCF is an ideal solution because it not only runs on-prem, but it also runs in the hyperscalers, it can run in other service mm -hmm. providers, so you get a, a ubiquitous platform on which you can run your AI processing, that's number one. We just released the solution uh, roughly two months ago, and we have hundreds of customers who are now working with us, and we were right here with a big <laughs> customer who, who is now deploying this and wants to work with us. So, a lot of traction, it's one of the hottest uh, new products that we have introduced. Definitely, in the because the data is on prem. I mean, it, 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 there's lots happening in the cloud, of course, yeah. but there's a lot of data on prem. Yes. Yeah, it, and I, I think the other thing I would say, Dave, in terms of the the adoption, right? We have to understand that. Uh, yes, if you're doing a massive training job to train a big model, you need thousands and thousands of GPUs, and you can ask, how do I, you know, where where do I get them? But enterprise AI, a lot of it is about just fine tuning a little bit of model improvement and inference where you're running the model, and a lot of those models, they fit on a single GPU, they run really well like on, a, on an OEM server with one GPU in the box, right? Um, and obviously, uh, there's a lot of those yeah. out there, right? So there's a lot of democratization. Well, well but what about that? Because inference is a big part of your strategy. Yep. Yeah. Um, Jensen and the earnings call, you guys announced already, I, I, obviously we've been doing Cube, so we haven't seen the results, but, um, but he said, last earnings call, he said, I think 40% of the enter enterprise workloads were, was inference. So you're was doing a, a lot yes. of inference, obviously. Yeah, you're doing a lot of inference. Yes. So, so, but, yes. but there's a narrative out there that says, oh, NVIDIA can't do inference. Uh, uh, obviously, that's not the case. That's help not us, the case help us square that circle. Why, why is that narrative out there, and what's the real story? Well, I think when, when AI use cases began, long before Gen AI, uh, the models were actually very small. Uh, and so the natural thing was we'll do the training on the GPUs and we'll do the inference on CPUs. But especially uh, as Gen AI has evolved, these models are much bigger and they're doing a lot more processing and the latency also matters. So that shift has happened and you have to run these models on a GPU now. The question is only how many GPUs do you need to run the model? Some of these models, like if you can look at Llama 3.1 with their 405B, you need like 16 GPUs to run the thing, right? Uh, other models you, yeah. you can fit on one GPU. So I think, yes, the world has completely changed. I think yeah. GPU is the place to do the inference, uh, but all our partners, you know, whether it's Dell or HP, yeah. or, uh, all of them, Lenovo, they build great servers now that are very accessible to any enterprise company to do the inference on. Mm. You know, one of, the, one of the things that we put out a year and a half ago, because we have been playing with a lot of the vector embeds with our data, was we saw the results, we're like, wow, this is, and it's not real AI, it's just RAG. RAG is a great innovation. Yeah. That comes from the benefits from other people. But when we started looking at the models, we saw that there were the small models could be very valuable, like ours is a small model. Yeah. So now that's, everyone talks about that now. But at that time, we saw a power law that looked like a straight curve down and then like a flat tail. But now you're seeing the specialty models kind of in the enterprise fill in. So the power law still got the big models like the llamas and the open AIs. But now as you go down the, into the power law, yeah. Yeah. you start to see mid-range models on the torso, yeah. the tail's got domain expertise, and then, it's digital, so it's neural, so they talk to each other. So this is something that we're seeing. You guys got the NIMS, the model uh, stores. What, how do you explain that to, to um, people that are used to the old world, or the yeah. old world, the world like a couple of years ago? Because yeah. they got to start writing software, yeah. build mechanisms, yeah. and build, set the table for agentic applications. Exactly, yeah. How do you explain that? Okay, so, uh, so I'll put it this way, right? Um, the way we think about AI at NVIDIA is, 
that it's an ongoing process. We call it the data flywheel, okay? So what happens is, uh, traditional applications have been static things. A software engineering team builds an app, and then it's out there, and you use it. The way these AI apps actually work is, I pick a model, right? I train it, I feed it some of my company's data, now I build an app with it. Once I start using that AI app, it's a rag, it's not going to be perfect, right? Sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong, and as it interacts with the humans, judgments are being made about whether it was right or wrong, and that is very useful information, so we call that reinforcement learning. And so as the app runs, you take that data from the app running, and you feed it back to further tune the model. That makes the model better. So now, tomorrow, your app has become better because the model inside is better. That means more people are going to be successful using it. You're going to generate more data that's going to feed back to the fine tuning. So it's this continuous yeah. data flywheel that you're actually implementing, right? So how do you do this, right? So the first thing we did at NVIDIA was we, we built all this software to actually tune the models, produce the models, then we did these NIMs. What are NIMs? NIMs are basically saying, you know what, as a developer, it's going to be very difficult for you to keep up with the state of the art, because models are changing all the time. We put these models inside this thing called a NIM, and all you do is deploy the NIM. And automatically, every day, the model that's inside the NIM is just going to become better for you, and you don't even care. It's an inference microservice, so basically. It's an inference microservice, so right? So, you yeah. talked about reinforcement learning, a lot of that is human-based, but now you're talking about machine-based. And by the way, I have to apologize to the audience, today's Tuesday. Earnings tomorrow. Tuesday. Reports t tomorrow, that's why you, point, you looked that's at why. me funny. <laughs> I apologize for that, <laughs> I thought it was Wednesday. But anyway, the reinforcement learning was very human-intensive, yeah. now you're talking about more machine-intensive. There's so much data being generated, yeah. and, and one app that's running is generating data that is helpful to tune another model for another app, right? It's, it's all about that data and where it's coming from, right? Okay, so we had NIMS, as you said, a, a great way for developers to get all the improvements, stay state of the art without having to worry about it, right? And then the final piece of the puzzle that we actually just announced today uh, from NVIDIA, and VMware is one of our launch partner for this, is what we call NIM Agent Blueprints because it's like, how do I in an enterprise actually start building my use case? Whether it's a customer service use case or it's a, it's a document retrieval use case. So given all the work we've done with various companies, our customers, we've built like this catalog of apps, if you will, right, that are ready-made use cases. That's what the blueprints are, and we've made them available. We just announced that today. Yeah. And as a customer, for example, when you adopt VCF, it's ready to go, it's ready to run those, those blueprints and people can improve them um, and adapt them, right? And uh, John, you mentioned Agentic, you know, that's really the next step. Yeah. Because as an enterprise, how do I get value out of Gen AI, right? That's the question people ask, how do I get value? We see two levels of value. One is, there's these generic use cases, okay? I've got PDF documents, can I ask questions? Yeah. Okay, I've got some customer service scenario, can I look up my records and say something? But the next wave is really agentic, which is do things. Look this up, make a decision like this, go to another system and tell it to do that, right? That's how we work yeah. when we do work. That's the agentic workflows. That's what we are focused on right now and we've produced blueprints to help people. Do, do you see it as a new category? Because this would fall under Jensen's new category yeah. R rule in my mind, well, rule is what he, what he sees. He said publicly, Gen AI is a new yeah, category. Yeah, I think you think of it so this way. It's a new way. workflow. Yeah, the first phase of Gen AI was basically information retrieval. A better way of doing search. Request and retrieve. Request yeah. and retrieve, yeah. a better way of doing search. Use vector databases and all of that. The next phase is help humans do their work which involves actual actions, right? And that's where the agentic stuff comes So we in. say large action, large language models become large action models, right? And it's, and way, it's yeah. multiple agents. Work. A lot of people talk about agents, co-pilot, you know, one agent, but we envision multiple agents working together, having you know, role-based access yes. as a human would, yes. understanding the, the, the big picture, understanding corporate objectives in a tree. Um, might be OKRs or, you know, yeah grow revenue or gain market share or, or, or increase profitability and the agents working together work toward that objective. That's a whole new application stack. So what makes, that's right. what makes VMware 
the, the platform to build those intelligent data applications. Give us the, give us the bumper sticker for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Don't be I mean, uh, go into detail. Yeah. Yeah. Don't want to know. <laughs> um, look, well, what has happened is that <laughs> AI has now moved from the research labs to mainstream in the enterprise. Yeah. And over the past four years, we both have been really working with customers to make AI real in the enterprise. And what we are seeing now is it's actually happening with this use case. And so, what customers want to do is not have a siloed, separate environment to run yeah. AI. They want the same environment they use for other applications with all the controls and governance that they put on the other applications to apply to AI also. And that's where VMware comes in because we are the infrastructure on which they run all their applications and now they can run AI on top of our infrastructure. And with the joint work that we have done, you know, we have made sure that the performance of AI processing is at least the same or in many cases better than bare metal running on our stack. Well, I can we say. We saw those, those, that data today, yes. and that's when I said software mainframe, because yes. that's what the mainframe did. It ran yeah. virtualization with no overhead. <laughs> it was unbelievable magic. Yeah. But, uh, well, no, I, I know I, you don't I, like that. I, 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 mean, I could just say, look, I've been in Palo Alto 25 years when I moved from the East Coast. Yeah. I think this relationship is really the magic of Silicon Valley because you see things early, getting in early. Yeah. When the engineers are talking to engineers, yeah. say, hey man, that's cool. Software, yeah. hardware, uh, software, yes. operating leverage. And then that kicks off and then other entrepreneurs come in, then that's global. Now we're at the point of hitting the street, mainstream. Yeah. So VCF stands up a cloud, yep. private cloud, I yes. get that. Yes. You guys are used to playing with clouds, with, yes. With, yes. With, with NVIDIA and software and all the hard, great hardware. How does a customer deal with this? Because is it DGX on VCF? You got the cloud, how does it work? Like am I going to run my apps on VCF? Oh, I, I think what does it all work? I think there's three layers of the stack. There's the hardware platform, you know, there could be different OEM systems, et cetera, as long as the GPU's in there. There's sort of like this operating system layer, which is what comes from VCF, VMware, and then there's the apps on top. And I think it's not about a single hardware. I think a VCF spans many different hardware systems from yeah. various vendors, and they all have architectures with GPUs in them now, yeah. right? So they're all supported, and so, it's it's not a statement about you know one particular one particular platform. And I think to your point about all this innovation, I'll put it this way, right? Uh, why is the iPhone an amazing thing? Because there's one platform called iOS, and every app builder with an idea is building on the same thing. And so as a customer, I have access to all of these apps, right? And I think Gen AI is going through the same thing in the enterprise, where there's a multitude of use cases. Uh, John, you and I sitting here cannot envision every interesting yeah. use case, but the millions of developers out yes. there can. And yeah. so we're just trying to provide them the consistent platform that they can all and go the build the apps. And the scale with. and the horsepower and the supercomputing is there. You know, Dave coined a term called Jensen's Law. Spend more, save more. <laughs> okay, he says that on the keynotes. Yeah. The more what you he buy, mean? the more you save. <laughs> yeah. 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 The more you buy, the more you save. But if you think about it, what he's referring to is, you got to invest in this infrastructure yes. to yeah. get the ROI of the category. Yeah. There's no other whaley way or mechanism because it's old. This yeah. doesn't cross that, there's no bridge to the other side. Yeah. You got to build the bridge. We have to understand there's a bandwagon and you need to get on the right bandwagon because Moore's Law is dead, right? So. Um, if you're on the CPU bandwagon, then the curve is looking like that, uh, but the needs of the application, of the AI application are going like that. Yeah. So you need to be on, on the GPU bandwagon so you continually get the horsepower and the throughput that you need. And that's a controversial statement that you just made, but, but the data plays it out. I mean, uh, when you look at the, the performance that NVIDIA has created over the last 10 yeah. years, it's a thousand X increase in eight years, versus Moore's Law is about 100x in 10 years. So I mean, the data supports what yeah, you just said. Yeah, to be fair, Dave, right? The, the reason we say that is uh, twofold. One, at the hardware level, of course the hardware is becoming much, much better, but there's a whole industry and ecosystem of people building software, and that journey is so early that there's many orders of magnitude yeah. of performance of improvement still available by the software innovation, yeah. right? And so both are multiplying together. Yeah, and the cloud, I, I, and the cloud I, I, guy, and the cloud guys prove that in Gen One SaaS. Guy with a credit card doesn't want to provision a data center or go to buy a, a box and yeah. host it in a rack. Just goes to the cloud. Now you got scale, 
the problems being solved right now with GenAI are problems that are hard. Entrepreneurs will solve those problems, yeah. and you couldn't do them years ago. Exactly. But that's a whole yeah. mind shift. But I do think the, the agentic conversation makes the AI or the, the application stack more complicated than what you described. Yes. It's, it's not, it's a different level. Maybe it's this three tier, but that application piece that you mentioned. That app, yeah, let's a, talk about that. A, right? a, okay, so I would, I'm going to put this forth. Yeah. In addition, there's a federated data management. You've got to connect yes. to the legacy data that's Absolutely. hidden inside yeah. all the applications. Remember, all the applications contain all the data, yeah. all the business logic, and it's locked inside of that. Yes. That has to be unlocked with a federated uh, of, of data management system. And above that, there has to be a way to harmonize all that data. So that when I say revenue, it means yeah. revenue, not bookings or not ARR. Yeah. It, there's a common language. And then there's a whole agent layer, orchestration agent, management of those agents that can understand and interpret those top-down goals. Absolutely. So there's a bottom up from the connectors and the back-end data systems you know, that, that live in, in legacy apps, and there's a top-down objectives of the organization. That's a profound change in the application that, that stack. Is, Dave. So I'll, I'll tell you a, a view in it, and in fact at GTC, Jensen had a few slides where he laid this out. The thing is, as you said, though the data inside every application is understood only by that application. So this problem is not to be solved by saying, let's suck out the data from every application and build one giant data warehouse. Right. <laughs> because that data warehouse is not going to understand work. all the it's data. It's a bottleneck. Right, but what's happening is, every one of these platforms is building its own interface, like ServiceNow has now Assist. There's a chatbot, if you will, there's a RAG in each of these applications. Salesforce, with the data exactly. cloud. Exactly, and right? so now what the application developer does is call into all these things, and all, that's the code I'm writing now. Yeah. I'm orchestrating, I'm pulling into ServiceNow here, but I don't need to understand the code of ServiceNow, because ServiceNow has given me yeah. a rag that I can talk to, right? And Salesforce has yeah. given me a rag that I can talk to, and then I've got some custom databases of my own, and I. I ask Salesforce a question through the chatbot, I get some answers, yeah. I vectorize and put it into my vector database. I do the yeah. same with ServiceNow, and now I run my LLM across That's that consolidated data. That's an operating system, it's an operating model. <laughs> but you guys are doing your job to provide the infrastructure yeah. and the capabilities, the, the system capabilities and, and that's that why you're I talked about the, the blueprints that we announced today, yeah. for a variety of use cases, we have sort of pre-done that job. Yeah. But developers. others have to yeah. invent that, that federated data management, the harmonization layer, the, the, the agent orchestration, which maybe, maybe you can do, because it's a workload. You go yeah. use case by use case, Dave. So if, if, I, if I can that. tell you about, uh, you know, the way we did this, we, we focused on three use cases that we launched today, okay? And we have many more coming, but, but I want to share these with you because, so you can understand. The first use case, which is like the broadest is, you've got PDFs. You've got charts, images, and all of that and that, right? And so we built this whole, uh, workflow for how do you intelligently extract information out of these charts and images, et cetera, and talk to your PDFs. That's something that every enterprise company would want to do. So that's like the broadest scope, if you will, right? Yeah. Then the next thing we did was for customer service, digital humans, okay? How do you interact with an avatar that behind it has a rag and is doing information retrieval and all of that, right? So we put that one out there. And the third one was very, vertical for healthcare, for drug discovery. Because what we see happening is in every company, there'll be some adoption and building of use cases that are fairly generic. But then you got to understand what business you're in. And you have to build the use cases for your business to get the most value. Yeah. To actually make your business be better, right? And so that's kind of what we see. Well, and you see that there are some, I know we're out of time here probably, but you see some examples, like for instance, Amazon.com, not the retail business, not AWS. They have agents that they've had to build, purpose built, yeah. that can do planning like for five years in advance, what SKUs are going to be needed, what warehouse capacity is going to be needed. And they have multiple agents that talk to each other, very complicated, but they had to build that whole infrastructure stack on their own. You, what you guys are doing is making that, they're democratizing that, making that horizontal for any that, customer. And we have the benefit that five years ago, you needed humans to write a million lines of code. Yeah. And now yes. most of that code is just An in the army models, of humans, yes. And you write a little bit of code around it, right? right? And right, that's right. low code as well. well. That's a master place. class on helping us that's figure awesome. out how our Thanks bot's going to be interfaced <laughs> with other, <laughs> other agents. Uh, let's, let's wrap this up and, and just with the future. DGX cloud on VCF, VGPUs. GPUs are now in the workflow equation. Obviously you're managing workloads for enterprises. 
what's next, guys? What's in the horizon? What's the, where's the relationship go next? Yeah, what and then yeah. I'll add. I, I think, I think, in order for AI to fly, Gen AI to fly, the hardware, the networking is evolving dramatically. You know, Jensen talked about some things like Spectrum X, et cetera. It's not, it's a full data center scale problem, right? How everything works together. And the work we are continually doing together is every time we make a click of innovation at that layer, the operating system sitting on top in VCF, vSphere, all of that, has to understand how all of that works. It has to abstract it on the one hand, but take advantage of its capabilities fully, like with DPUs, for example, to accelerate the network. And so that's the massive engineering work we're doing together, click by click, right, so. And I, I would just add that uh, resiliency is one of the key things that a platform like ours provides, and that means uh, high availability of the GPUs. If a GPU goes down, moving the workload to some other one that is working. So you can checkpoint that, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, checkpoint that and move it to some other GPU. So all of that is the area of focus for us, so that the same kind of resiliency you get with the CPU, you are getting with the GPU going forward. And so you like this relationship? Oh, it's Spend absolutely. more, save Fantastic. more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, it's an ROI no, I game. I mean, it is. it's uh, two data points, the NVAIE, software stack that NVIDIA has. It was first announced on VCF and VMware. And today, all the new announcements that they have now are on top of VCF again. So we have a very close partnership. We are the first out of the gate with uh, NVIDIA. The goal is simple. Yeah. We have to democratize AI for yeah. enterprise companies, yeah, right? So that they can all do it and they need a platform yeah. to do their work on. Yeah. Otherwise it's too much And chaos. all the hardware's right? getting That's faster, platform. smaller, cheaper, yeah. better, next level. Yeah. I mean, this is the future. Platform engineering, data engineering, the, this engineering mindset, the systems revolution is upon us. I feel like we're in the 90s again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No. We're getting old. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Sets of people, you know, the data scientists have been in this party for a while, yeah. having fun doing AI, but there's now two new constituencies for the IT teams, guess what, you have a new platform to deploy in your company. The Gen AI platform with the right hardware and yeah. software. And yeah. for the developers who've written apps in enterprises, you can join the party. There's a new kind of app to build, yeah. which yeah. is these rags, these yeah. agentic things. You got to get on the right side of history. And, and again, you guys are a great use case. Get in early, understand the software impact, yeah. leverage yeah. the infrastructure and the, and the hardware, and build the next system. Yeah, guys, thanks so much. Man, it'll be great to see you again. Chris, great as process. always. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah. VCF looks like it's going to be packed full of the one-two punch. Yes. NVIDIA. Yes. And yeah, right. absolutely. Thanks guys, appreciate yes. it. Thank you. Okay, it's CUBE coverage here. Hey, we go, we'll go whatever it takes to get the story and share that data here. Soon it'll be uh, digitized. Thanks for watching.